our subject this morning, the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ or the gospel according to four women. To lay a foundation for our message this morning on the genealogy of Christ, I need to introduce the importance of numbers, especially as they're found in the Bible. You'll find that numbers are prominent and necessary in every realm, whether you find it in science, whether you find it in the Bible, whether you find it in geometry, whether you find it in chemistry, wherever you go, you're going to run into numbers. We cannot operate without numbers. Everything is numbers. Right? We have telephone numbers. We have social security numbers. Everything revolves around numbers. And you are a number. You are a number of that number God has chosen for Himself. So we have a number. Numbers and the structure of the universe was first brought out by a man named Pythagoras. Pythagoras was born on the Isle of Samos in 582 in Asia Minor. Pythagoras was the first philosopher of all the ancient philosophers to recognize the importance of numbers. His discovery that numbers permeated everything in every field, whether it be astronomy, chemistry, botany, mathematics, even the Bible. It's everywhere structured by numbers. His philosophy of the law of numbers is known as the Pythagorean philosophy. Plato, another famous Greek philosopher, saw that same fact when he said, Surely I perceive that God doth everything by time, number, color, and weight. The Baptist Larkin stated, God has been called the great geometrician and is said to do everything after a plan and by number, weight, and measure. And instantly when I read that some years ago, my mind went to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12 where God is pictured standing over His creation and the interesting thing about this picture that he presents of himself is that he's holding a pair of scales in his hands and a measuring rod. And he's doing some measuring and numbers are involved. I read Isaiah 40 and verse 12. Speaking of God, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Now you'll notice a number of mathematical numbers here. Meted out the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. What is God doing here? He is balancing our planet. Because if our planet was not perfectly balanced, it will roll out into eternal space and be lost forever. When God created the universe, He weighed the mountains. He measured the waters. He created it in balance so that it would subsist and last, what an amazing thing. If he had put too much water in the oceans, or if he had moved the planet too far to the right or to the left, we would either burn up or die. God, in His amazing, unfathomable wisdom, created balance in the universe 
when He created it. Now, if you were to go to the scientists, they would tell you that that means equal pressure on every side. There has to be an equal amount of pressure to keep the universe from burning up. And the scientists would call that iostasi. That's their scientific name for it. And it means that by gravity, God has preserved the earth with equal pressure on every side. Now that would be the scientist's use of gravity, but we have another use. He upholdeth all things by the word of His power. So you see that numbers are important in the creation of the universe. Numbers are important in every field, no matter which field you go to. Now, I'm going to use two numbers this morning for a certain purpose. The first number I want to use is the number seven. Every number in the Bible has a specific symbolic meaning. What does the number seven mean? It means perfection. Perfection. Wherever you find the number seven in the Bible, it speaks of perfection. It speaks of completeness, of fullness, of plenitude. For instance, there are seven days that makes a perfect week. There are seven colors in the spectrum that makes a perfect spectrum. There are seven notes of scale on the piano. Seven octaves that makes a perfect scale. There are seven eyes spoken of in Zechariah 3 9, speaking of the perfect omniscience of the Holy Spirit. Then the number seven occurs no more than 600 times in the Bible. You can see the importance of numbers by the fact of how often it is mentioned. Nearly 600 times on the seventh day of the week, that is the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. For Christians, that day is special. It is the day our Lord arose from the grave on the first day of the week. We set aside the first day of the week as the Lord's Day. The Jews worshipped on the Sabbath, which was the sixth day. In Psalms 12, 6, the Bible says, Purify silver seven times. That means completely purified. And then in Luke 17, 4, you have a sevenfold sin, a sevenfold repentance, and a sevenfold forgiveness. And that's the scope of salvation. Sin, repentance, forgiveness. In Revelation 2 and verse 3, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, you have seven churches. Why seven? There were more churches. For instance, the church of Colossae is not mentioned in Revelation. And the church of Hierapolis is not mentioned in the book of Revelation. But he mentions seven churches. He wrote letters to seven churches because those seven represent a perfect number. And those seven churches are representative of all of the churches. In every one of those seven churches, you will find some good and some bad. You will find some things that He commands and some things that He disapproves of. And so they are representative churches. There are seven. In chemistry, all chemical elements have atomic weights and they are grouped in sevens according to periodic law. They never change. In the book of Revelation, for example, you have an amazing use of these heptads, that is sevens. There are groups of sevens. There are seven churches represented by seven lampstands. There are seven stars representing the seven angels of the seven churches. And there are seven lamps representing the seven spirits of God. Now there's only one Holy Spirit, but when it speaks of the seven spirits of God, it means the perfection of God the Spirit. It means the fullness, the plenitude of God the Spirit. So it uses the number seven. There's a seven sealed book, sealed securely 
and completely. There's a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. Now we know Jesus doesn't have seven eyes and we know He doesn't have seven horns. But He is described as having seven eyes and seven horns because that seven speaks of perfection. This is the perfection Lamb of God. And then there are seven angels blowing seven trumpets. And there are seven angels pouring out seven vials of wrath according to the book of Revelation. Then there are seven thunders that utter their voices. And the beast out of the sea has seven heads. And the dragon has seven heads and seven crowns upon his head. The completeness, the fullness. So we'll leave number seven for a moment and go to number six. That's the second of the two numbers I want to use. What does the number six speak of? It speaks of man. Six is the number of man. And all the way through the Bible, whenever you find man described, he's always described by a six. Six is seven minus one. Seven is perfection. Six is man, which means that six minus one would be seven. Or six plus one would be seven. So six is seven minus one. Seven meaning perfection. Seven minus one is imperfection. And that's the state of man. He is not perfect. You will never find on this earth a perfect man. I may be perfectly wonderful, but I'm not. I am not perfect. <coughs> man is a six, meaning that he's come short of the glory of God. He never made it to a seven. There are some men that they don't drink whiskey, they don't curse, they don't lie, they don't commit adultery, they don't uh, steal, they don't get put in jail. And on a scale of man's uh, weight, he would uh, weigh out pretty good. But he'll never be a seven. Not until he gets to heaven. When he gets to heaven, he'll be a seven. But right now, he's a six. He's one short of being perfect. And uh, in fact, most of us don't even get up that high. I'm sure of that if we were honest with ourselves. In Scripture, God created man on the sixth day. In Scripture, there are six different words that describe man. Goliath, who is a type of the Antichrist, was six cubits tall, six pieces of armor he wore, and his spear weighed six talents. Everything about him was a six. And I could expand on that, but I won't take the time. Nebuchadnezzar built an idol and demanded that the Jews worship that idol. And that idol that Nebuchadnezzar built was 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and 6 instruments were used in the worship of it. So you see, the 6 is everywhere that touches man. Cain's descendants are given only as far as the 6 generation. Now when we look at the number six, everywhere it points to man. Or when we study man, always he's involved as a six. So we have a seven and we have a six. We have perfection and imperfection. We have Christ, the perfect man, and we have him as a man. When we come to the genealogy of God's ancient Jewish people, we find Jesus is included in the genealogy. You can start with Adam, and you can go all the way through the Bible until you come to Jesus. Do you know how many generations are to be found in Luke, the third, God, third chapter? If you go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, you'll find that there are 76 generations. And do you know who the 76th person in that list of genealogies is? Jesus Christ. Perfect, 
7. 6. Man. The God man. The perfect man. How marvelous does God work? Suppose Jesus had been born a year later and some other person had come into that genealogy. Suppose he had been born a week back. He couldn't have been the 76th person. But he was the 76th person. Seven perfection, six man. Perfect man. Number 76. And Jesus is number 76 from Adam to himself. Isn't that an amazing thing? How minute, how perfect our Bible is. How many books of the Bible do we have? Somebody want to answer? How many books are in the Bible? 66? Anybody want to take a guess? The Bible is perfect. And we see the perfection, the minuteness in everything that God does in the Bible. Now we turn to this perfect man, the 76, the Lord Jesus Christ. Suppose Jesus had been the 77th man, then that wouldn't match up with it. But he is the God man very God of very God and the man Christ Jesus he's the 76 and he's the 76th person in his genealogy amazing is this Bible how amazing it is now I want to go to the genealogy and look at it and we find when we look at it amazing thing happens first let me read the text Matthew chapter 1 the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Judas, verse 3, Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Thamar. And Solomon, that's Solomon, verse 5, begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David, the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. That's Bathsheba. Now you have four women mentioned here. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba or the wife of Urias. <clears throat> now design in nature is a proof of the existence of God. This genealogy we're looking at this morning is a proof of divine inspiration. In this genealogy, we find the names of four women. Of the 76, four of them are women. And they have a place in the royal family of the coming king, the Lord Jesus Christ. They are also representative women they picture God's way of salvation. Before four men wrote the gospel according to four men, these four women wrote the gospel according to four women. Now it is unusual to find women in the genealogy. The Jewish people never included women in genealogies. They spoke of the father, the son, the grandson, the grandfather, but never women. Women are never found in the Jewish genealogies. Yet here's an amazing thing. Here are four women found in the genealogy of all these men. Why did God put these four women in this genealogy that's exclusively for men. Ah, there's a reason for that. This minute and marvelous Bible always has a reason for everything it says. The Jews took no cognizance of women 
in their genealogies. And these four are mentioned. And with the exception of Ruth, every one of them had a vile and gross sin connected with their name. And God takes these four women, three of them with vile sin in their background, and puts them in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Can you imagine the grace of God? These four women all became believers. And as they became believers, they're included by the grace of God in His family. Tamar and all four of them were Gentiles. None of the four were Jews. Tamar was a Gentile, a Canaanite. Rahab was a Gentile, a Canaanite, the mother of Boaz. And Ruth was a Moabitess, also a Moabite. And the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, was a Hittite. Now these four tribes, God rejected. They were never given the gospel. These people were never brought into the commonwealth of Israel. They never had an atonement made for them. They were rejected of God. And yet, among these Canaanites and Gittites and Moabites are four women who have nothing to commend them to God. And yet God, in His marvelous grace, saves these four women brings them into the family of God and includes them in the genealogy of Christ. That's an amazing thing to me. Now I propose this morning to show how these four women in the genealogy of our Lord picture the Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel according to four women. What is the Gospel according to four women? <clears throat> Excuse me. The first principle of the gospel is that salvation is for sinners. And Tamar pictures salvation of a sinner. Tamar's story, you can read it when you get home in Genesis chapter 38. It is such a vile story that I would not recount it in this congregation. <clears throat> it is a black story. Not for public reading. Tamar's sin was followed by the birth of a child. Her child is going to be in the lineage of the coming King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Tamar's name appears in this record for one reason, because of her sin. So the first premise of the Gospel is that man is a sinner. When I was a pastor in Ventura, California, at 2.30 in the morning, my phone woke me up. And I groggily reached over and got the phone, and it was a phone call from the hospital. And on the other end of the line was a man. And he said to me, uh, I found your name in the phone book, and I'm calling you because I want to answer to a question. I said, if I can help you, I'll be glad to. He said, I'm going to die in the morning. He said, they're going to do surgery on me for an inoperable brain cancer, but they're going to take a chance just hoping that something might help if they get that tumor out. But this type of tumor that I have is 99% incurable and inoperable. And he said, they have told me to set my affairs in order that I am going to die. We have no hope for you that this surgery will be successful. So in the morning, they're going to operate on me and I'm going to die. Now he said, my question is, is there anything I need to do to be ready to die? I said, yes sir, there is. I said, are you saved? He said, I don't know what that means. I said, well... Do you trust Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? He said, I don't have any sins. I said, beg your pardon? He said, I don't have any sins. I said, we all have sins. For the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Well, he said, uh, I've done some things that are not right, but I'm not a sinner. And I don't like to be called a sinner. And if you don't have anything better than that to tell me, uh, I don't want you to come see me and I don't want to talk to you any longer because I am not a sinner. And he hung up. The only thing that could have saved that man would have been to acknowledge that he was a sinner and turn to God and ask God for forgiveness and he could have been saved. But he rejected the one thing that he had to do in order to be saved. He had to come to Christ as a sinner. And that he refused. He hung up on me. He didn't want to hear that he was a sinner. And you know why the churches are filled with people? It's because the preachers don't tell them that they're sinners. <laughs> the preachers make them feel pretty good. I visited a hospital one time at the request of a relative. The lady in the hospital was dying of cancer. And I went in and sat down beside her and I said, you know, we need to be sure of one thing and that's your salvation. I said, have you ever been saved? She said, I belong to the Methodist Church. I said, but have you ever been saved? And she said, I, I live a good life. I said, but have you ever been saved? She said, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, let me tell you how Jesus saved sinners. She said, well, I'm not a sinner. And I said, well, I beg your pardon, the Bible says you are. And uh, so I visited with her a little while. And uh, she had a lot of other questions to ask. And so I went back again and sat down beside her and I said, well... Have you thought much about your salvation? Well, she said, Preacher, I'd rather you not come to see me anymore. She said, You know, every time you come to see me, you tell me how bad I am. And every time the Methodist preacher comes, he tells me how good I am. And she said, I'd rather side with the Methodist preacher because I think I am good. And I don't believe I'm a sinner. So she said, Please don't come back anymore. I didn't go back anymore. The Bible says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to make us feel better? No. To give us a good reputation? No. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And only as we come as sinners will He save us. And if we don't come that way, He will not save us. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, I'm quoting the Bible, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what knocked me off the Christmas tree the night I was saved. I really thought that I was about the best person in town. I wasn't a drunkard. I never cheated on my wife. And I never robbed any banks. And I was in that category. And I would have died and gone to hell had not that preacher preached that Jesus came to save sinners and you are all sinners. And I said, if we're all sinners, that means me too. And God showed me that night that I was a sinner. And I came to Jesus with all my sin. And I asked Him to save my soul. And He did. You read the parable of the poor publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee stood and prayed in the temple. God, I thank Thee I'm not as other men. I tithe and I give twice a week and I fast. Lord, I thank Thee. And he related his goodness to God. He said, I thank Thee I'm not like this poor old publican here. Poor old publican bowed his head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this man, this poor old publican, went home justified 
declared righteous in the sight of God. And this poor Pharisee died and went to hell. There's a lot of Pharisees around today. There are not many publicans. I'm happy that I took my place along with the publican, the poor old publican that said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake. And the blessed old preacher named Herbert wrote this poem. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Ye wretched sinners, come and lay your load at Jesus' feet and plead what He has done. How can I come, some soul may say. I'm lame and cannot walk. My guilt and sin have stopped my mouth and I sigh but dare not talk. Come boldly to the throne of grace, though lost and blind and lame. Jehovah is the sinner's friend and Savior is His name. He makes the dead to hear His voice. He makes the blind to see. The sinner lost. He came to save and set the prisoner free. Come boldly to the throne of grace, for Jesus fills the throne, and those He kills, He makes alive. He hears their sigh and groan. Poor bankrupt souls who feel and know the hell of sin within, come boldly to the throne of grace, the Lord will take you in. Mr. Herbert had it right. <coughs> The old time preachers, that was written a hundred years ago, they knew what the gospel was. They knew it was a gospel for sinners. And Tamar tells us that the first premise of the gospel is that man is a sinner. Now the second principle of the gospel is illustrated by another woman. Her name is Ruth. She is found in verse 5 of Matthew 1. There is no blot on Ruth's character. But Ruth had a disability. Ruth was born under a curse. When Israel was going through the wilderness, as they marched along, the Moabites came against them, refused them a passageway, afflicted them, hired Balaam to curse them and place a curse upon Israel. And God took hold of Balaam's tongue and made him bless Israel instead of cursing Israel. And because of that, God put His curse upon the Moabites. And Ruth, who came back to Bethlehem with Naomi, was a Moabite. She was under that curse by being a Moabite. And Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3 says, An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. God shut them out. He said, No Moabites. So all the Moabites were rejected of God. But, you remember that when Naomi went down into Moab, among the Moabites, God dealt severely with her. God brought Naomi back. And Naomi had two daughter-in-laws. Their sons had died. One was Orpah and one was Ruth. And they said, we'll go back with you to Bethlehem. And she said, no, I can't give you any more sons. Why would you want to go back with me? And Oprah went back to her gods, the Moabites. And Ruth said, I will, I will go where you go. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. That's not just a ceremony for a wedding. It's usually quoted in every wedding, but it's Scripture. And Ruth came back with Naomi to Bethlehem. And something happened. She went out in the field to glean and she met a man named Boaz, a wealthy landowner. And Boaz's eyes fell on Ruth and he fell in love with her. And he 
found a way to redeem Ruth from that curse. And when Ruth came to the God of Israel, God saved her, despite the curse upon her people. In Ruth 2.12 we read that the Lord said through Boaz to Ruth, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now she was shut out by the law of God, but she was brought in and received by the mercy of God. Did you know that we are in the same position of Ruth? We are under the curse of the law. We have all broken the law. Adam broke the law. And we are under, as a people, the curse of the broken law of God. We've broken the Ten Commandments. You say, I have broken many of them. If you break one, you're guilty of all ten. And so we too, like Ruth, are under the curse of the broken law. And anybody that breaks the law is going to have to pay the penalty. And the penalty is death, eternal death. And unless that sinner finds mercy with the Lord, as Ruth did, under that curse, he will go to hell. But Jesus fulfilled the law by His perfect life upon this earth. He never broke the law one time. He fulfilled the law. And God imputes His perfect righteousness to our account as sinners, which justifies us in the sight of God. And we are no longer under the curse that we came under with the broken law. Like Ruth, we as sinners like Tamar, we have come to the Lord. And He has imputed the righteousness of Christ. Christ's perfect law-keeping to our account. And so we stand before God in the perfection of Jesus' righteousness. I don't expect to get to heaven by any righteousness that I've ever done. But I expect to get to heaven on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because God promises me in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Romans, that if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He will impute and He has imputed the righteousness of Christ to my account. And on Christ's righteousness, I can enter in. But the Bible says, For as many as are under the works of the law are under its curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You've got to do them 100% perfectly if you're going to be saved by keeping the law. But no man is justified in, by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus, hanging on the tree of Calvary, took the curse that we had on us and took it unto Himself and became accursed for a moment on the cross of Calvary in order that we might not be cursed. He bore the curse that we deserve. I heard a preacher telling about illustrating that by something that happened in the old days. When they had these Model A Fords and they had these straight bumpers, you know, and he went down to the ice house to get a 50-pound chunk of ice to put in the old refrigerator type. They didn't have electric refrigerators. They had these ice boxes. And you buy a 50-pound chunk of ice, put it in the upper part of the ice box, and it would keep things cool for about 24 hours. So he and his little daughter, about six years old, went down, got a 50-pound chunk of ice, and he put it on the bumper, and they drove home. He got out of the car, and he took that rope around the ice and started to lift it. And she said, Daddy, no, no. I want to do it. I want to lift it. He said, it's too heavy for you, hon. You can't do that. 
Yes, I can. I want to do it. Daddy, let me do it. He said, all right. I let her do it. And she got hold of it. She ooh, 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 ooh. She looked up at him and said, Daddy, I can't do it. He said, you know what I did to her? I shut her mouth. You know why God gave the law? To shut our mouth. Mm -hmm. To stop our boasting. Saying, I can do it myself. I don't need God. I can do it myself. God gave us the law. Mm -hmm. When you read the Ten Commandments, you'll be like that little girl. I can't do it. I can't do it. That night I was saved, I realized I couldn't keep the law. I had to have somebody keep it for me. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That is, in His flesh, He condemned sin on the cross of Calvary. In looking through my tears, one day I saw Mount Calvary. Beneath the cross there flowed a stream of grace enough for me. Grace is flowing from Calvary. Grace is fathomless as the sea. Grace for time and eternity. Grace enough for me. While standing there, my trembling heart, once full of agony, could scarce believe the sight I saw of grace enough for me. When I beheld my every sin nailed to the cruel tree, I felt a flood go through my soul of grace enough for me. When I am safe within the veil, my portion there will be to sing through all the years to come of grace enough for me. God has enough grace for all the sinners that will come to Him. The third principle of the Gospel, I'm going to have to hurry, is salvation by grace through faith. This is pictured by Rahab. The Bible says in verse 5, Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. Rahab's story is told in Joshua chapter 2. She was a harlot. The Bible says she was a harlot. And yet we find her in the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's grace. And she sheltered the spies that came into her city of Jericho. And they said, because you have believed in our God, when we come in to destroy Jericho, put a scarlet cord out the window. And when we come in with our army to destroy Jericho, we will spare all the people in that house where the scarlet cord is hanging out. That scarlet cord is a picture of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our Savior is the only thing that will obviate the judgment that we deserve. He shed His blood for the remission of our sins. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. She put her faith in the death of Jesus Christ. In His shed blood, she relied on that for cleansing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God applies the blood of His Son to your heart and you're saved. The old hymn writer wrote, I have tried and tried in vain many ways to ease my pain. Now all other hope is past. Only this is left at last. Here, before Thy cross I lie. Here I live, or here I die. If I perish, be it here, with the friend of sinners near. Lord, it is enough, I know, never a sinner perish so. Here, before Thy cross, 
cross, I lie. Here, I cannot, cannot die. You will die if you make your way to the cross. The fourth and the last principle of the gospel pictured by the wife of Uriah. And God doesn't call her the Bathsheba. He calls her the wife of Uriah. Verse 6, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. This is another dark sin. Bathsheba is not used as her name here because her name was connected with her vile sin and she was a child of God. God saved Bathsheba. And I tried to put a picture in the bulletin of Bathsheba and her child Solomon. She was the mother of Solomon. But David committed adultery with her. And you know something? After she came into the wings of Jehovah, after she became a believer, although she was a, of a foreign tribe, uh, <coughs> tribe, she became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, typically speaking. And because she was a believer, God covered up her name by using her that had been the wife of Uriah. It reveals the sin of David. It's a sin of a child of God. So what happens when a child of God sins? David sinned with Bathsheba. And God had promised to raise up through David a son who would be the Messiah, the Savior. And all of our salvation depended on that son. And David sinned. Now what happens to the covenant of God? David, you've sinned. What happens to the coming king? David, you've sinned. What happens to the throne everlasting? David, what have you done? God's answer is, David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And God placed the crown on Bathsheba's son, Solomon. And the royal line from David to Christ will include the wife of Uriah. That's grace. That's grace. So what do we see? Tamar tells us salvation is for sinners. Ruth tells us salvation is by grace. Rahab tells us salvation is through faith. And Bathsheba tells us that it's eternal and everlasting. If you have it, you'll never lose it. So it's for sinners, by grace, through faith, forever. For by grace are you saved through faith. That is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Let us pray.